Good morning. I don't know if it is uh, on. Uh, well, let's uh, start uh, this uh, singular event. Uh, dear Adam Smith, Chief uh, Scientific Officer of the Nobel Media. Yeah. Uh, dear Eduardo Recoder, President of the AstraZeneca Foundation. Uh, dear students, dear prof uh, professors, all of you, welcome. It's my privilege and pleasure as the dean of uh, this faculty to welcome you here, all of you. Uh, we are today, as you know, honored to have uh, my Brit Moser with us. Prepare yourself to be challenged, uh, excited, and inspired by her words. Uh, dear my Brit, thank you for coming. And uh, just before I hand over to Adam Smith to uh, make a short introduction of her, I want to say once more, on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, welcome. It's uh, wonderful to see you here. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. As Dean Diaz says, my name's Adam Smith from Nobel Media, and on behalf of all at Nobel Media, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's lecture, which, as you see, is part of the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative. This is a global collaboration between Nobel Media and AstraZeneca, which takes Nobel laureates around the world to meet audiences of young scientists like all of you. We've been running this for eight years. We've run 24 events on five continents, but we've never been to Complutense before. And so I'd like to thank the Faculty of Medicine at Complutense and Dian Diaz for so beautifully welcoming us and for providing this incredible audience, which is exactly what we want to see. In fact, it's so much exactly what we want to see. I want to take a photograph of you all and I want to send it back to Stockholm so that they know what this is all about. So. Thank you. Now, when we started planning this event, my colleagues in AstraZeneca in Spain said, um, Spain's an important country and we want to be ambitious for this event. So I know most Nobel laureates are men, but we'd like a woman. And we know that most Nobel laureates are older, but we want a young woman. And we know that most Nobel laureates are not so active in research anymore, but we'd like somebody who's really active in research. And I said, that sounds like my Brit Moser. <laughs> but she is really hard to get. I've asked her before to come to things, and she's terribly polite, but she says, no, I'm too busy in the lab. I'm sorry. But there must be something special about Spain, because when I asked her to come to Spain, she said yes. <laughs> so I think we're very lucky. And I like to think about the initiative as a way of reminding us how exciting science is. We all join science because we love it, and then after a while we begin to realize that experiments don't always work and we don't like the lab and we can't get money, and you begin to lose focus sometimes. So it's very nice to be reminded how special science is, and I cannot imagine anybody better to remind one of that than my Brit Moser. So I will leave it to her to do that job, and I'd just like you all please to welcome my Brit to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the warmest welcome I've ever got, so I will remember this. And um, 
Before I start my talk, of course, I would love to say thank you to the organizers, to uh, Adam, who asked me to join, so the Nobel Initiative, uh, AstraZeneca for paying, <laughs> and for, for the university here, and for the dean organizing this, and to all of you that you want to spend one hour with me and try to understand what we are doing far north. So I hope you get some uh, ideas. So I'm, I'm interested, and I hope, that when I'm done here, then you have some ideas how memory is encoded in the brain, what is necessary to make memories. And uh, I give you some cues here, space, time is important. Once upon a time, there was a tiny girl, and she had one mission in her life, and that was to try to understand the world. And it developed into this idea, I want to understand how the brain is generating behavior, memory, our cognition, our emotions. And do you know what happened then? This girl, she was so lucky that she became a scientist. And as a scientist, she was allowed to ask these questions in the lab. And what also happened was that um, I experienced something that I want to share with you, because it's a way to show you one of my memories. It happened in 2014, and I was sitting in Trondheim, I was talking to uh, the people in the lab, we had an exciting discussion, and then I got a very annoying phone call. <laughs> and I understood after a while that the message was not annoying. an example of a very strong episodic memory. And Endel Tulving, in the 70s, he said, if you want to study episodic memory, there are three key questions that you have to understand. And if you want to understand how the brain is dealing with this, then you know a bit more about episodic memory. And that is what I hope that we can do today. So there are three questions. Where did it happen? When did it happen? And what happened? What we also know is that there is a brain structure just inside here uh, in the temporal lobe that is called hippocampus. In fact, there are two of them. And it's called hippocampus, as you know, because uh, it's, uh, uh, hippocampus uh, is seahorse, and it looks like a seahorse. So this, this uh, hippocampus here is dissected out by a, person, a professor in Hungary, Laszlo Ceres, just to show how similar the hippocampus is to the seahorse. 
What is important is that even in the 50s, we heard about this structure. Because there was one man that you probably have heard about. He was called H.M. at that time, Henry Molaisen. Uh, he had to remove both of his hippocampi because he had epileptic seizures. And the medicine didn't help him. And then they did some experimental surgeries and to remove the hippocampus. He woke up and he was a very nice guy. So he was social, he was laughing, he, was, uh, he looked very normal. And then they started to test him with the IQ tests and he was better than before because he wasn't disturbed by the seizures. But when people came back, even after 15 minutes, he said, I've never seen you before. So he couldn't encode new episodic memory. He couldn't even know how to find the bathroom. So he didn't have the where. And he didn't have the time because he didn't know when th things had happened and in what sequence. But he could learn other things. He could learn to, to write uh, from a mirror and he could learn quite some, some things, but everything that had to do with episodic memory, even to learn that his uncle had died, he couldn't encode into his brain. So in our lab, we, were, we started with where. But before we started with the where question, there is um, an important man, uh, besides my ex-husband, Edward Moser, and that was my supervisor, John O'Keefe, who we earned the Nobel Prize with. What he did was to ask, there is something special with this hippocampus structure, since it's so important for HM and other patients. If you don't have it, you can't encode episodic memory. So he had then a rat, and he had small sensors close to the cells in the hippocampus. And the rat was just walking around happy. So in his lab, they got um, rice. In my lab, they got chocolate, of course. So what happened is that he was just studying this rat running around chasing rice or chocolate. And then he asked himself, if I listen to one hippocampus cell, what is this hippocampal cell reacting to? Can I understand that? And I'm going to play the video, and then you can see yourself, even though I have given you a cue here. So now you hear one single cell that is active. And you see the rat is doing exactly the same thing, chasing chocolate. So what is so special about this corner? We even use this uh, color code to show you that there is something very hot in that corner. This cell is responding to something in that corner. And then could it be that there's a special odor? Could there be some scratch in the floor? What is it? So John and others recorded many cells and they found out that each cell had its own preference where to be active and where to be silent. And if you record more than 100 cells at the same time for some time, then you can predict where the animal is with a five, uh, five centimeters precision. That's quite remarkable. So just by listening to the cells of this animal, you know where the animal is with the precision of five centimeters. That's scary. So for Edward and me, it started, really started, when we could have our PhD defense in 1995. 
So here you see Edward and here you see me, our oldest daughter, and uh, our supervisor, Per Andersen, and uh, here we have John O'Keefe. So the link to go to his lab to learn uh, this technique, uh, to learn to record from these single cells in the hippocampus, that was uh, quite easy. So at that time, we brought two children with us, and we brought this technique to Trondheim. So the first question we had when we explored this was exactly what I asked you about. Why are these cells active and where is this information coming from? Is it so that the information is processed within the hippocampus itself? Or is it fed in from a structure, brain structure, outside the hippocampus? And in order to address that question, we had this fantastic uh, student uh, who took his uh, medical uh, uh, PhD and the medical degree at the same time in our lab. And this is, um, this is a rodent brain. In fact, this is a rabbit brain drawn by my supervisor, Per Andersen. You see, if you lift the cortex, then you see this beautiful structure. It looks like a sausage. But, but, but it's beautiful. <laughs> and if you then slice it, you see these lines of cells here. And the information in hippocampus is coming from enterina cortex. It's going through this loop uh, here in dentate, up to C3, and then up to C1, and then back again to enterina cortex. So we asked, is it so that if we block this loop in the hippocampus, do you still get play cells? Yes. So we got, so the higher examples of seven beautiful play cells, even though uh, we cut this loop in the hippocampus. So what did that tell us? The information that these cells use to generate the place signal has to come from outside. And our best guess, that was entrina cortex. So then we took our sensors, our electrodes, and we decided to place these electrodes in the entrina cortex. So this is a brain, rat brain, that you see from behind. The cerebellum is removed, and this colorful area here is the entorhinal cortex. The right one, that is the medial entorhinal cortex. And at that time, we collaborated with Menno Witter, who is now in Trondheim, uh, running his own group. And we decided to put our sensor in the most dorsal part of the medial entorhinal cortex. People had been recorded up before, but they had recorded down here and concluded that there's nothing interesting. So now you have to, to see yourself. I'm going to play another video. There's no sound, but there are some white dots telling. Do you see anything? Or there, there's some strong light there, so I don't know if you see. You see it? Okay. So you see these white dots? And this is uh, the activity of one single cell in this area, in the entorhinal cortex. And you see that uh, it looks not so nice. So maybe these people were right. There's nothing interesting in the dorsal, uh, or in, in the entorhinal cortex. But if you have a big enough environment, and you have really happy animals, that love to chase chocolate, so that you get enough coverage, you get a pattern that looks like this. So this is in a 150 by 150 box. These black traces, that is where the, the trace of the animal, and the blue dots. One blue dot, that is one electrical potential from these cells. And what you see here is that there is a very regular pattern. And this is biology, so it shouldn't be so that you can fit in equilateral triangles into a pattern that is generated from biology. And remember how deep 
this cell is in the brain. So we did this together with uh, Marianne Fien and, and, and Torkel Hafting when Marianne was a PhD student in our lab. And we decided that this cell, which is sending information to the hippocampus, might function as a 2D ruler, a metric system in the brain. What is fascinating is that when you go from dorsal to ventral, then it's like if you, if you draw this grid cell pattern on a balloon and you blow up, then there's an expansion when you go more and more ventral in this structure. That you see here, so cell one, very dorsal, small fields close by, and then bigger fields further away, and then you have fields that are really big and quite far away. So why do I tell you this? Because I want to bring you back to hippocampus and ask, how can you come from these grid cells to a play cell? Is that possible? Because that is our hypothesis. Yes, you can. So if you align these grid cells on top of each other, you just do a normal linear summation. Then you see here in the middle, there's a bump, but at the edges, everything is cancelled out. And what do you get then? You get one bump, as we saw in the hippocampus. I have another question to ask too, and that is, how can this cell be so precise? It doesn't have eyes, it doesn't have ears, it doesn't have a nose, except on the animal, of course. So what type of information does this cell need in order to be so precise? It needs to know the direction of the animal, and it needs to know the speed, because when the animal is eating chocolate, it's stopping, it's running fast, and it's changing position all the time. So then we asked, are there such cells close to the grid cells? And Francesca Sargolini from Rome, she came to our lab and she showed that there are some cells close to the grid cells that uh, uh, we call head direction cells. And they were not discovered by us because they were discovered in another uh, brain area uh, by uh, Jim Rank and Taube. But she found them in entorhinal cortex, medial entorhinal cortex. So these cells work like this. So when the animal is going west, then it's pop, 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 pop. And then there's another cell, so it doesn't help if the animal is going only to west, but it has to point north in order to get the cell to be active. So this information is then giving to the, given to the grid cell. But we also need information about the speed of the animal. And then the question this Argentinian uh, postdoc had from Patagonia, Emilio Kropf, he asked, is there a speedometer in the brain feeding the grid cells with information? And he designed a car for the rats, because if you want to find cells that respond to the speed of the animal, you have to control the speed of the animal. And then, um, if you can decide the speed of the car, then it's fine. But it's not completely fine, because the animal might fall asleep. So how can you keep the animal awake? The animal has to run. And that is why we have the Flintstone car here, to remind us that the animal is running. And in this way, Emilio could change the speed of the animal as much as he wanted. And I can show you one example of um, such an experiment that he did. So here the animal is running north, and here the animal is running south. These lines are just the individual laps that the animal is running, and these red dots, that is just where the animal uh, or the cell is active. And you see when the speed is high, the cell is very, very active. Boop, 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 boop. And when the speed is slow, the, active is all, the, the cell is almost silent. And it doesn't matter whether the animal is driving north 
or south. The cell is signaling exactly the speed of the animal. And that is what we see also in 2D. So when the animal is just running, chasing chocolate in a box, like you have seen now so many times on these videos, so here we have 12 cells, and what you see here is that the pattern, uh, the firing pattern is not interesting, but what is interesting is to see the correlation between the activity of the cell at the y-axis and the speed of the animal. And you see it's a beautiful linear summation. I have a message here, skip this version. I don't want an update on my computer now. So, these two types of cells, they inform the grid cell about the speed of the animal and the direction. Then we asked the question, how is this process running? And we had two Chinese, postdocs, uh, Miao and uh, Chichen, and uh, we asked together with them, is it so that the GABAERG uh, interneurons, are they involved in the precision of the firing of the grid cells? So to address that question, they ordered Cree mice that uh, had uh, a Cree activity on the parvabamine uh, cells, and also the somatostatin. And they used this uh, uh, artificial receptor technique, the DREAD technique. So you just use a virus then that will go only to those cells that has the Cree tag um, in these mutant mice. And then you use an artificial ligand, like the CNO. And then you can activate or inhibit only those cells that you are interested in. And that is exactly what Miao and Chichen did. And this is an example of three cells. No, oh, one, one cell, sorry. So, so, so uh, this is before they gave the artificial drug. This is when the drug is working, and this is when the drug is leaving the body. And you see that when there is drug in the brain of this mouse, this grid cell doesn't look like a grid cell anymore. And if you ask the grid score how much grid-like is the cells, then you see that when this drug is working, then we have much fewer grid cells in these mice than before. And the same thing happened with the speed. So you see here's the speed signal. When they have the drug, it's flat. When the drug is out of the body, then there's a speed signal. And that is summed up here, and you see that uh, the speed score is very, very uh, uh, bad when, when this drug is working. And then, so what we showed here is that the pavalbumin cells are giving inhibition to the grid cells to keep the correct position of the fields. And the somatostatin, they did not have this effect, but they worked on, uh, on, on different uh, type of cells. So, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm rushing because I have so much to tell you, and I know that I have limited time, so you have to shout at me if you think that I should move on or go a bit slower, or we have some questions at the end. We also uh, want to compare the different maps in the hippocampus and um, and uh, the, the uh, uh, entorhinal cortex. And what is that very, very different, these maps? So the grid maps, they work together, all the grid cells from the same module. And it's like a mathematical paper that you bring with you. You might rotate it, you might shift it, but it's always the same. And that is illustrated here that you go from room to room and it's absolutely the same map. What is interesting, and this is not published yet, uh, English uh, postdoc Richard Garner studied the grid cells when the animal was sleeping. And then he asked, those cells that are active together 
when the animal is behaving, are they also active together during sleep? And that is what you see here with the cross correlation when the animal is running and when it's uh, uh, deep sleep, slower sleep. So you see, then they are correlated, but the cells that are not correlated during running, they are not correlated during sleeping either. So it's the same map even when the animal is sleeping. This girl, Charlotte Alme, a Norwegian PhD student in the lab, she worked with the hippocampus and she tested the animals in 11 rooms. And she asked, is it so that the hippocampal map is similar to the entrenal map, that it is the same map that is used over and over again, or does the hippocampus create new maps? And what is a map in this case? It's the activity of the different cells. So what she did was to put all the recordings from the different 11 exposures to the different uh, rooms, put them on top of each other, and then she asked, are these correlated? And you see here's familiar one, familiar one, and of course the same room is very correlated. But it's a lot of blue here, meaning that it's not correlated at all. That means that cells that are active in this room are not active at all in the other rooms. Except if you go back to the same room, then even after one exposure, the hippocampus is using the same map. So to just sum it up, it seems like we have so many uncorrelated maps in the hippocampus where you can store your memory. And that is different than from the grid cells that can rather give the metric to the spatial input. So then we have to rush on to ask the next question. Are there any indication of information in the entrenal cortex telling the hippocampus about time? Then we got this absolutely fascinating and fantastic uh, PhD student. He came to Norway from Washington when he was 18. So he was almost the same age as my daughter. And I said, no way, this is not good. He was so excellent, you can't imagine. So he said he wanted to study the lateral and trinal cortex, and he was allowed to do that. So that is the sister structure of medial and trinal cortex. So the grid cells are here, the lateral and trinal cortex, that is where he put his electrodes. This poor guy, he came to Edward and me, and he showed his results. And even though we loved this PhD student so much, because he was so skilled, we said, this is not right. Because he had so unstable recordings that we said something must be wrong. And it took him eight years and us to discuss this, and before he found out what was wrong with the data. What was wrong with the data was that time had been running in between. And this is illustrated in the experiment that uh, he and, and uh, Jürgen, another uh, PhD student or a postdoc in the lab, did. So that was uh, in the same room. You can have this situation where the animal is running around in this box. You can have white walls, black walls, and you run the animal, put the animal in the box, put it back again, you clean between each, and that is exactly what happened. So this is the black box, white box, white box, and then in between you have this pot situation. What happened with the cells is that each individual cell seemed to respond differently to this situation. So if we go to this cell, this cell said, I'm measuring how much time the animal is running in the box. So you see, if it's the black box, the firing rate is low and then increasing. Low, increasing, low, increasing. So it's measuring time in, or the trial time. This cell, is doing something different. 
It's measuring the whole session, starting with high firing rate, and at the end of the last white box, there's almost no firing at all. And another cell is telling about what color uh, the box had and also how much time the rat was spending in each box. And then you have the same thing here with, with the wall color and the different sessions. So this was the confusing part. So then Albert came up with, what if we use the general linear uh, model to, to ask what can tell us uh, best, how can explain the variance in these data in the best way? So then he asked, what about the wall color? Does that explain any variance at all? And he compared the data from the lateral entorhinal cortex with structures that we were happy about, the CA3 from the hippocampus and the medial entorhinal cortex. And not much happened when it was only wall color. Then he asked about the position. And you see that the medial entorhinal cortex with the grid cells, they signal position best of these three structures. Then he asked about wall color and position, asking, is it a white box or black box? And where is the animal in the box? Then C3 said, hey, this is my function. Then he came to lateral entorhinal cortex. And lateral entorhinal cortex was telling about time. So it was like a clock ticking, tick tac, tick tac, tick tac, and giving a tag to each episode that the animal experienced, each box. And this is just uh, when it was mixed, it didn't say much. So it seems like you have this running clock that can give you a tag to every episodic memory so that you can sort your episodic memories in the correct sequence. But as the spatial information is subjective, also time is subjective. And you know that. Maybe some of you think that this is such a slowly moving hour. And some of you think, oh, time is going so fast. And this happens also in the brain of these animals. Because when the animals were allowed to run in another task that was very repetitive, so they were asked to run in this H-shaped maze, up and down and up and down and up and down, and they got a reward, then time between each trial that they went to this uh, apparatus was gone. They couldn't, these cells didn't tell much about that time. But now these cells, this exactly the same cells, told about how much, where in this apparatus uh, is the animal. Because the experience uh, is telling you about time. And this experience is so different from running in these different boxes. How, how much time do I have now? I have uh, 10 minutes maybe, or less? Five? 15 minutes. You are an angel. <laughs> wow, then I can relax. <laughs> ah. Okay. So then the last question. Because when we have memories, we don't only know where it happened, when it happened, did it happen before, lunch or did it happen after lunch? But we also have people in our memories, we have objects, and for the rats, it's easier for us if we ask this what question with objects. So we have this situation for the rat or for the mouse, that the uh, animal is exposed to a Duplo or Lego tower or some toys that we put in. Because you remember the other boxes, they had only chocolate. Now we have chocolate and a queue. And uh, uh, Jim Knierim in, uh, in the States, he asked this question first. So he had these different objects. He put them in the box. 
did exactly what we have been doing, giving the animal chocolate, and these white circles, that is, uh, that is uh, four of these objects, and then these are different cells that respond to these objects, and when the cell is responding to the object, you know now the code that when there is color, there is activity. So then this cell is just pop, 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 here's an object, pop, 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 here's an object, pop, 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 here's an object. Then, how many of you remember this guy? <laughs> the time guy? He is also the object guy. So what he did was again to play. So you know, it's so important when you have questions that you really wonder how to address, that you can play. So we have people in our lab playing, trying out things, and suddenly they see something that is so exciting. So what Albert did was he was recording them in lateral and terminal cortex, and he had this situation, it was this box, he had a Duplo tower here, and he had trained the rat for 14 days. And then he said, I have found some of these cells that Jim Knierman found that uh, respond to the object, but I want to see what happens if I remove the object. So it is like you sit in a party and you wait for a, your, your, your best friend, and your best friend's chair is empty. Where is my best friend? So that happened to the rat. The rat was walking here in the object. It had been exposed to this object for 14 days. And this cell said, something is wrong. Look, it's firing, even though there is no object. So we decided to call these cells trace cells because they are the memories of what was there before. And then Albert started to play. So he moved the object to a new position. And you see that when he was moving, the trace was also exposed. So in this situation, he had moved so many objects and this cell responded to all of these moved objects. There's nothing there. And he even cleaned the box with alcohol, with soap. There's nothing. And still these cells are saying, I have a memory for this place, there was an object. I have a memory for this place, there was an object. Then, we have some other data that uh, are not published. So, Eivind Heydal is uh, the main person. He's a Norwegian PhD student in the lab. And he was working with mice, and he did uh, what uh, Albert did, give the mouse an object. He recorded now in medial and rhino cortex, so he could record both grid cells and uh, other types of speed cells, border cells, other types of cells. And then he asked, are there some cells that respond in a metric way to the object. So if this is an object and you record from my medial and rhinal cortex, do I have some cells that respond in a metric way how far I'm from this, uh, this uh, table and also what direction I am? And he found that. So you see, this is an example of if there's no object, there's no firing. When the object is there, then uh, you see a high firing rate uh, close to the object, and, and different cells, they signal the different distance to the object. And different cells, they even signal the different direction to these objects. So I thought I had less time, so I removed those slides from uh, my talk. But I can tell you that when, when uh, Eivind moved this object to a different position, this field moved after. Same distance, same direction. And different cells have different distance, 
different uh, directions. So we think that these cells tell you where are you relative to the object. So it seems like objects are coded into our episodic memory. How much time now? Ten minutes? Thank you. Then I, I will end with um, uh, uh, something that uh, is, uh, is already published for some years ago, because I find it so intuitive. When, when you think about your episodic memory, and if you think about an odor, then it's so easy to retrieve a memory. Can you think about an odor that can give you a memory that you haven't been thinking about? Is there some paella or something that is uh, smelling so, something? Oh, I'm back <laughs> to Spain. So this was uh, uh, treated by Marcel Proust, of course, uh, in his uh, novel, talking about when he was a child, he was sitting with his aunt, and he got the tea, and he could dip the madeleine cake into the tea, and it was this lovely taste. Then when he was uh, grown up, he did the same, and he was sent back to his aunt. We studied this in the lab. How can you study this in the lab? Can you think about a task? You need an aunt, you need a madeleine cake, you need a cup of tea. At least we have odors in the lab, and we have the rat Emma. And Emma, she is giving the task that when she is smelling chocolate, she should go to this corner, and then she is getting a reward. When she is smelling banana here, then she should go to this corner, and then she gets another reward. Do you think that Emma can do this task? It's quite complicated. Yeah? Should we see? That was chocolate. Chocolate. Banana. She's good. Chocolate. No! Uh, it doesn't help to cheat. And now she, is, uh, she can't concentrate. Do you know rats are like us? They give up sometimes. Banana? Yeah. And now she's back on track. And what this guy did, Kei Igarashi from uh, Japan, was to record simultaneously from the hippocampus and the lateral entorhinal cortex when Emma and her friends solved this task. What was so exceptional with what he did was that he was able to record from the cells when Emma started to learn this, when she was completely naive, until she had learned the task. So he could follow the process in the brain when these two positions were coded and the positions were associated with the odors. And this is, uh, this is uh, the last complicated slide, I will promise you, and it's very complicated. Um, but I, uh, we, we, we would just go through it, and then you get some idea. So this is recordings from the hippocampus, and these are recordings from the lateral and internal cortex. Each line here is one cell. Here, and another cell in lateral and internal cortex here. This first panels, that is when Emma is naive. She doesn't know the task at all. Or she has had some trials. And then this is when she is more skilled, and this is when she's very, very good, doing just a few errors. And this is when she's doing errors. Then you can see these colors that we have here. These colors are just 
the activity, the poop, 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 of the different cells. Some cells prefer the chocolate, red, and some cells prefer the banana. And this is where Emma is smelling the different odors. What I want you to see here is that here, the maps are quite empty. There's not so much colors. But when the animal, when Emma is skilled, you see there's a lot of red activity and a lot of green activity in both structures. So that means that in Emma's brain, she has developed a map that is a combination of the odor and the place. And what happens when Emma is doing an error? Her brain is empty. Have you ever had this feeling that your brain is empty? <laughs> that happens. There's almost no color, no active cells telling Emma where to go. That's life. So we think that we have now discovered cells in the brain that code for where something happens, when it happened, and what happened. And then the hippocampus is fed this information, is receiving this information, so that the hippocampus can generate our episodic memory. There are some people who can't do this. And that is those people who have a lesion, a damage, when these cells are dead. This happens in some groups of Alzheimer's disease patients. It happens in also other people. So they have problems to encode new memories because these cells are, are dead. They have problems with spatial navigation. They even have problems to encode the sequence of events. This is the group, how it looked like uh, one year ago, only Edwards and my group. And I've told you about the people that have been involved. And of course, Edward has been involved in everything. We have got a lot of support from our local university, the Kavli Foundation, the Research Council in Norway, uh, the European uh, framework, uh, the ERC grants, and Louis Chante, Kerber, uh, Madame Betancourt supported us, and so on. And then I would just like to end with another memory that I would like to share with you. I'm from the coast of Norway, and just enjoy. Thank you so much. You have been an extraordinary audience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if... Hello? Yes? No? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moser, for your brilliant talk and, as you can see, highly inspiring lecture. And now the session is open for questions, so we encourage especially young people, students, young researchers to uh, ask questions to Professor Moser to use this unique opportunity. So, is there any question? There? Can we get some light Here? in the room so yes. we see you? Now we have Good. Light. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Yeah. First of all, Tusen Tag is oh. wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously amazing to have you here, and I'm super excited. This might be a bit of a controversial question, but um, I assume most of the rats are male for like interference with hormones and so, but you were talking about Emma, and since spatial awareness is kind of like a gender issue, there's people saying, oh, you know, women uh, have less of a spatial awareness and memory. So I was wondering if in, in the lab you've put in Emma and their counterpart Peter, let's say, <laughs> and if there is any difference or all brains after all are the same mm. in the way that they work with these grid cells and space cells and head cells. Thank, Thank you, you for asking this great uh, question. So we had uh, especially uh, a postdoc from Britain, Ross Langston, and uh, when she started in lab, she said, I'm only going to work with females because I'm going to prove that females have grid cells, border cells, head direction cells, and of course, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Lisette Menendez de la Brida from Cajal Institute uh, in Madrid. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was uh, really clear. And uh, I'm very glad that you can uh, come to deliver this uh, new data in, in this uh, uh, fantastic venue. So, my question is uh, uh, regarding Cajal. So, Cajal identified the, the neuronal doctrine in which the cell identity is the building block of the brain. So my question is whether do you uh, think that the functional categories are related with the cell type specificity? Uh, what did you say, if the functional... Grid cells yeah. or speed cells. Oh yeah, how, how you get functions out of uh, the network? Is whether, that your question? Whether they could be related with a cell type specific of the internal oh, cortex? Oh, thank you for asking that question. So, so that was our dream when we found or discovered the grid cell, because if there would be a marker, a genetic marker or something with these grid cells saying that I'm a grid cell if you did only anatomy, that would have been fantastic. But we haven't been able to do that. So the, only, the closest we have come is uh, this uh, data that I showed you from the Chinese couple in the lab, where they show that it seems like uh, the stellate cells in layer two of the medial and rhinal cortex are receiving inhibition from the parvalbumin cell, cells around, and then in order for these cells to be active, they have to get the information from the hippocampus. We have shown that by uh, giving musimol so that we inhibited the activity in the hippocampus and the uh, entrinal uh, stellate cells, they were left alone only with uh, the inhibition that surrounded them. And another input, and that is the head direction. And what happened then was that before the grid cells disappeared, some of them became head direction cells. So that is telling us something about this network. And that is also why we thought this was so interesting to see that the interneurons stain with somatostatin. They are not involved in generating the grid cells. So we are closer to this. But what we also know is that the stellate cells are also border cells and they could have other different functions. So it, it doesn't even, it's, it's not enough to just say stellate cells are grid cells. So it's still a very puzzling question, but highly exciting. So we have some uh, interesting uh, ideas how to solve that. And we have some wonderful, wonderful postdocs working in the lab trying to solve this question. But uh, that is science. You never know what you get. Sorry, I'm not young. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a physician, but a physicist. 